In the headlines, South Korea opens direct trading of its currency with China's yuan, facilitating trade based on their currencies and reducing dependence on the U.S. dollar. Pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong clash with police as they try to surround Hong Kong government headquarters to revitalize their cause. And in Korean politics, lawmakers scramble to come to terms on 2015 budget. If the bill gets a green light within Tuesday's deadline, it will be a first in 12 years. Hello and welcome to Arirang News. Coming to you live from Seoul, I am Kang Chere. South Korea has moved one step closer in emerging as an international hub for offshore yuan transactions, a direct trading market for the Korean won and the Chinese yuan open today. Our Hwang Jie takes a look at the potential benefits of this new market. A one yuan direct trading market launched on Monday in Korea, and that means local exporters will feel less of a burden from overall transaction costs when exchanging the two currencies. Up until now, local banks had to convert their Korean won into U.S. dollars at home and change them again to the yuan in Hong Kong. The new currency market reduces the transaction process, making it more convenient to exchange the two currencies and cutting down on costs as well. The market is also expected to ease risks stemming from possible global currency shocks as it diversifies currencies used in trade settlements. Experts add that the new currency market provides an opportunity for the seven local banks and five Korean branches of foreign banks that the government has chosen as market makers to boost trading. Through the measures, local banks are participating in setting the price of the Chinese yuan, which is emerging as one of the major international currencies. This will help them grow as global players in the financial market. But there's a long way to go before the market realizes its full potential. Korea's central bank pledged support if needed. If it's necessary to stabilize the market, we will provide some of the yuan that was secured through our currency swap with China. The market will be open every weekday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. with a minimum transaction amount of 1 million yuan or roughly $160,000. The one opened its first day 180.30 against the yuan and closed the day at 180.77. Now there are high expectations the new currency market could breathe new life into the local financial market. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. The details on Samsung Group's annual reshuffle of positions are out. No drastic shifts were made this year and no one from the controlling E family was promoted. Analysts say the group is focusing on keeping management operation steady as the chairman Lee Gon Hee is still in the hospital after suffering a heart attack back in May. It is the first reshuffle after his absence. Uh, Samsung Group heir apparent Lee Jae Hyung kept the three CEOs at Samsung Electronics, but did send a warning signal to the slumping handset sector, removing three presidents of the IT and mobile division from their post. Samsung. Electronic saw some of its worst performance numbers last quarter, with profits hitting a three-year low and sales falling below $50 billion for the first time in two years. Korea recorded another trade surplus for the, uh, for the month of November. That's the 34th straight month maintaining a positive balance. But analysts say the outlook for next year's numbers is not looking too great because of the weak Japanese yen. Kim Jung has more. Despite concerns stemming from the weakening Japanese yen, 
Korea's annual exports are expected to reach $1.1 trillion by the end of this year, with new record highs for our trade volume, export volume and the trade surplus. The trade ministry says annual exports grew by 2.4 percent during the January to November period from the same period last year. This comes amid concerns raised by Korean exporters of unfavorable currency conditions, mainly due to the strengthening of the Korean won against the weakening Japanese yen. But it may be too soon to celebrate as local experts say this year may be the period of calm before the storm. Up until now, Japanese exporters were passive in cutting their unit prices, but that may change next year as their profitability is improving due to the weak Japanese yen. More aggressive reductions by the Japanese are expected to take a toll on Korean exporters next year. The Korean exchange rate hovers at around 931 to 100 yen, the lowest it's been since 2008. The expert also attributed to Korea's declining exports to China and a U.S. interest rate hike as some of the main concerns that could affect Korean exports next year. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. The labor participation of Korean women is among the lowest in the OECD, and the gender gap among male and female workers is wide. Sound familiar? It's a common refrain for the Korean economy, one that specialists around the world talked about on this Monday. Our Kwon Soa fills us in. The average Korean woman is almost forced to choose between her career and raising a child. While more women are entering the workforce here in Korea, the glass ceiling certainly remains very much intact. Korea's chronically low birth rate and rapidly aging population are about to bring about a huge shift. The problems surrounding women and work in Korea can best be described as chronic. To address them and come up with solutions, government officials and experts from Korea and abroad gathered for discussions this Monday. More economic participation of women will contribute to achieving gender equality and gaining economic benefits. With Korea's long average working hours and difficulties returning to work after taking maternity leave, job flexibility was stressed at the conference. The government has been developing diverse policies to support women to maintain their career while keeping work-life balance. One of these core policy is the family-friendly cooperation certification. That policy gives incentives from the gender ministry to family-friendly companies, making more part-time positions available and providing assistance to female re-employment support centers was also mentioned. International leaders say the Korean government's goal of raising the female labor participation rate to 70 percent is ambitious but attainable. Uh, the country has extremely highly educated uh, pool of educated women, which is a very good baseline to start. Uh, and then secondly, it has very clear policies, not only policies, but plans how to get there. Uh, and I think now it's just a matter of implementation. As women in Korea are expected to outnumber men next year for the first time ever, domestic and international leaders are emphasizing now more than ever the importance of raising the labor participation rate of women. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Moody's Investor Service has cut to Japan's credit rating by one notch to 1A1, that is, assigning growing skepticism over the success of Abenomics. The ratings agency said Monday the downgrade was caused by heightened uncertainty over Tokyo's ability to meet its debt reduction goals and the timing and effectiveness of its growth-enhancing policy measures. The announcement could be a setback for Prime Minister Shinzo Abe just a day before he begins campaigning for an election with an emphasis on the economy. Japan's rating is now on the same level as Bermuda and Israel and one notch lower than South Korea, Saudi Arabia and Taiwan.
Solar power is one of the fastest growing sectors in the renewable energy market worldwide. There were concerns about high costs, but now it's becoming more and more affordable. In this week's uh, Industry Insight, our Song Ji Sun takes a look at where the Korean uh, solar power industry stands and some of the challenges it's facing. This is the biggest solar power plant in the capital that started operating this summer. It's equivalent to 13 football fields with a capacity of 5.6 megawatts, enough for 2,200 households a year. This solar panel system has been set up on the roof of this water filtering plant, and we have completed a couple of other solar power facilities like this for the Seoul Metropolitan Government. It's fully operational even on cloudy days and only takes three months to install and operate. The market for these solar facilities is booming in Korea, accounting for 98 percent of all renewable power plants built in the first half this year. Over the past decade, solar energy has emerged as the world's biggest source of renewable energy, overtaking wind power. Last year alone, it created half of total electricity generated from renewable energy sources. The solar energy market is forecast to expand by 10 percent each year by 2030, with China and India likely accounting for half of the global demand. By then, the cost of generating electricity from solar power is expected to reach similar levels to burning fossil fuel, meaning it could become more widespread without the support of government subsidies, as it mostly depends on that at the moment. The biggest competition in the industry comes from China, which produces 80 percent of the global demand at prices 20 to 30 percent cheaper than Korea. Backed by government support, Chinese companies have been producing well over the market demand with half of the world's top 10 solar panel producers based in China. It's not easy to counter them in terms of price, so Korean firms must improve their cost efficiency at the same time revving up quality and technology. Around 40 players are in Korea's solar power generating market, with small and mid-sized companies focusing on solar cells or modules, while large conglomerates aim to tackle the global market by equipping a complete chain of production and after-sales service. We've established a value chain from solar component production to system maintenance, and we aim to expand the solar power generation infrastructure to even include households. Industry experts point out that it's crucial that the government take steps to speed up the growth of domestic solar power market. To expand the economy of scale and improve profitability, the government must ease regulations concerning installation. They also point out the government must provide financial aid to companies seeking projects overseas to help them win more share of the world's non-fossil fuel energy market. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. Lawmakers are scrambling to come to an agreement on next year's budget bill so that it can be put to a vote at Tuesday's plenary session. They've already extended their budget review deadline, but our Chi Myung Gil says they've got a ways to go before striking a final deal. The clock continues to tick, and Korea's two main rival parties are doing all they can to pass next year's 340 billion U.S. dollar budget bill by the legal deadline of December 2nd. We decided to extend the budget review deadline in hopes of passing the budget bill tomorrow. We are also looking into passing auxiliary budget bills by Tuesday's legal deadline. We are not 100 percent satisfied, but our party is doing its best to secure budgets that will improve the livelihoods of the people and make Korea a safer place to live. They hope to finalize the review process before Tuesday's plenary vote. If they don't, the government's original version of the bill will be passed automatically. The ruling Saenuri Party and main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy have narrowed their differences on a number of issues. They have agreed to allocate some $85 million for President Park Geun-hye's vision of a creative economy. They agreed to subsidize a free child care program using the Education Ministry's budget and to scale back on corporate tax reductions. They've also accepted the government's proposal to increase cigarette prices by an average of $1.80 per pack starting next year. However, the parties are still at loggerheads over tax-related bills that are attached to the budget. Those will be put to a vote on Tuesday with or without bipartisan agreement. 
The ruling Saenuri Party is calling for cuts on inheritance and gift taxes to revitalize the economy, while the opposition party says the revision gives unnecessary tax breaks to the rich. If the parties manage to achieve their goal of passing the bill on their own accord, it will mark the first time since 2002 that the parliament has passed the budget by the legal deadline. Kim young Arirang News. The National Assembly's Foreign Affairs Committee, meanwhile, adopted a resolution on Monday calling for action against anti-Korean protests in Japan. The resolution recognizes that anti-Korean speech and demonstrations in Japan threaten the safety of Koreans living there. It urges the Japanese government to work on ending the so-called uh, hate speech protest against the Korean residents, further pointing out that the Korean government will put more efforts into protecting its citizens citizens from such action. President Park Geun-hye says she hopes the Japanese government will sincerely propose ways to prepare for a leaders' summit during Seoul and Tokyo's periodic government talks, meeting Japanese business leaders for the first time since taking office last year. President Park, who recently talked about a trilateral summit with Japan and China, said Seoul was open to creating a favorable environment for a summit. This is widely interpreted as referring to Japan taking responsibility for its uh, imperialistic atrocities such as its wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. Asking the Japanese business community to be the pillar in developing bilateral ties, President Park also said that she hopes for the two sides to expand trade of consumer goods and to launch more economic cooperative projects in a third country. President Park Geun-hye uh, has ordered an investigation to find out who's responsible for leaking information about one of her former aides. It's being coined as a Chung yun hye gate here in Korea after a recent media report claimed that the president's former aide, Chung, had been meeting with presidential secretaries on a regular basis and was plotting to oust the current presidential chief of staff. At a meeting with her senior secretaries Monday, President Park took the case head on and denied the claims. She said her office frequently receives information that's based on rumor or speculation and that the prosecution should look into the case to find out who leaked the information and for what purpose and to seriously punish those responsible. We have about 28,000 U.S. troops stationed here in South Korea. But according to recently released documents, there might not have been any today if former U.S. President Jimmy Carter had his way. Our Connie Kim tells us more. In January 1977, soon after U.S. President Jimmy Carter is inaugurated, he orders a review on the removal of all U.S. troops from South Korea. Top government officials strongly oppose the idea, but Carter stands firm, working on reports that the two Koreas had balanced military power, thereby making it harder for them to go to war. Two years later, Carter backtracks, citing a buildup in North Korea's military strength. Now we have a better idea of what changed then President Carter's mind thanks to a recently declassified CIA document. Carter knew at the time of his announcement that North Korea had 80 percent more tanks in its arsenal than previously reported and had deployed some 270 tanks and 100 armored personnel vehicles within 100 kilometers of the demilitarized zone. He would later learn that Pyongyang had three additional army divisions and an extra brigade, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. The nonprofit National Security Archive would later discover that Pyongyang had 650,000 ground troops and 41 ground forces division, much higher than the 450,000 troops and 28 divisions previously reported. In January 1979, the National Security Archive's report was leaked, leaving then-President Carter no choice but to abandon his review and plans to pull U.S. troops from the peninsula. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Today, December 1st, marks the World AIDS Day, a day aimed at raising awareness about the fight against HIV. There are nearly 10,000 HIV-positive individuals here in Korea. That's only the official, officially recorded figure. Local activists say, though, Korea could do so much more to fight the virus. Our Connie Lee has this report. 
The number of people with AIDS is increasing here in Korea. In 2006, 749 new cases were reported. However, in 2013, more than 1,000 new cases of HIV and AIDS have emerged, making the total number of patients currently with the virus at over 8,600. The report, released by the Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, shows that 92 percent of the patients are male, with most of those infected in their 20s and 30s. HIV, which stands for human immunodeficiency virus, attacks the body's immune system, and the later symptoms of HIV infection are referred to as AIDS, a debilitating disease that requires more attention here in the nation. In light of World AIDS Day on December 1st, activists took to the streets of Seoul on Sunday, urging the government for more support. I hope the government will take the lead towards changing social perception on HIV and AIDS. Activists say HIV patients are discriminated against and receive inadequate health care. They say there are no facilities that care for patients long term. Most HIV patients who are in need of long-term medical care look after their own health at home with special medical equipment. Or some get treated by going from one hospital to the next. However, there are small steps being taken by the government in the fight against disease. Public health centers in Seoul offer free HIV testing. However, the results are not available until about a week after. Now Seoul is hoping to speed up the process. Starting next year, we will offer rapid HIV testing. Results will be provided in 20 minutes using just one drop of blood. This service will help in early detection and help the spread of HIV. And once the patients are confirmed as HIV positive, the Seoul city government plans to offer them basic medical subsidies. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Thousands of pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong have clashed with police once again in one of the most violent scenes since the start of this movement back in September. And uh, for more, uh, Paul Lee is joining us from the News Center. Paul, this latest confrontation took place at the city government headquarters on this Monday. What triggered this sudden outburst? Well, tensions have been rising there over this past week, with the government stepping up efforts to dismantle this protest movement piece by piece. Large crowds of demonstrators trying to surround the government headquarters this morning and then break into the offices of Chief Executive C.Y. Long. In response, riot police aggressively pushed back the mob with batons and pepper spray, a move many protesters condemned as an excessive use of force. Because we don't have any weapon, we, we just have no weapon, but we try to use all the weapons to attack us. And so many people are injured and they're breathing. And although we are breathing, many people are breathing, they, they, they don't have a sight to stop their violent actions. At least 40 people have reportedly been arrested with authorities, citing 11 officers injured in the battle. Mm. And uh, turning to South America, Paul, uh, the final results are in from Uruguay's a presidential runoff election with the highly expected win going to the ruling left-wing party. The people have spoken to so tell us who's set to become the country's leader. Well, that would be the broad party's main candidate, Tabaré Vazquez. This will be his second term in office as nation's head of state, extending the decade-long rule of the leftist coalition. The 74-year-old doctor-turned-politician won by a comfortable margin with nearly 53 percent of the vote, while his center-right challenger, Luis Lacaze Pau, trailed with about 41 percent. During his victory speech, Vazquez vowed to address the country's rising crime rate and follow through with education reforms, all the while keeping the momentum in the economy. Mm. And uh, finally, retailers in the U.S. have survived another round of frantic sales as uh, Black Friday events have wrapped up this uh, past weekend. To give us a breakdown of the figures. Well, fresh reports by various trade groups showed this year's Thanksgiving shopping weekend turned out to be a more subdued affair. Proper insights and analytics said less than 134 million people in the U.S. shopped online or visited brick-or-mortar stores. That's down 5.2 percent during the same period last year. Overall spending also took a fall, coming in at just under 51 billion U.S. dollars. 
The National Retail Federation is still optimistic that sales during the holiday season will increase by over 4% by the end of this year. Mm, if I uh, participated in this whole cr frenzy, I could have uh, helped those numbers a little bit. All right, uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Paul. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you back here in just about two hours. And happy Monday. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with your weather forecast. So it was a snow and chilly morning here in Korea, and some regions are still getting flurries. It looks like another 3 to 10 centimeters is expected for the western part of the country and about 1 to 5 for the eastern regions. Also at the moment, a strong wind watch is in effect for most parts of the country under partly cloudy skies. Tomorrow is shaping up to be another chilly day, but conditions may feel colder due to the wind chill factor. Other than that, some regions may get higher than normal levels of fine dust, so be aware of that. On to tomorrow's readings. Seoul drops to minus 7 in the morning before reaching minus 1 in the afternoon. Busan hits 5. On to other regions. Tokyo makes it to 2 degrees. Mount Kumgang drops to minus 12. Those are the updates I have for you now. I'll be back with more after 10. See you then. Thank you so much, Bo Gyeong, and that wraps up this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching and join us again for a primetime news at 10 p.m. Korea time. See you then.